Now, in our next interview, we'll be exploring the issues facing the commodities industry after the initial impact of COVID-19. The first shock Africa received from the coronavirus came not through the virus itself, but through the commodity markets. They saw a collapse in the price of resources such as oil and copper, though interestingly not in gold. So how quickly will prices recover and how will the industry emerge from this crisis? To answer these questions and more, I'd like to welcome the executive chairman and CEO of Trafigura, Jeremy Weir, and your host for this session is our natural resources editor, Neil Hume, who joins me here in the studio. Thank you, David. And Jeremy, we're, I'd like to, in, like to welcome you to this, this session on commodities. Now, before we sort of get stuck in and debate the outlook for prices across a range of commodities, I think you've got a few uh, opening remarks you'd, you'd like to make. Yes, thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure to be here at the F FT African Summit. Sorry, it's a virtual uh, session, but uh, that's the day we, that's the sort of the environment we live in today. Um, just a, maybe just a few comments. Um, Trafigura, the company I represent, is a long-standing partner of Africa. Um, we trade uh, roughly 30% of the uh, exports or inter-country inter trade in Africa of copper. Um, roughly just under 10% of our oil uh, turnover is African, and we trade roughly 6 million barrels a day. We also trade gas, cobalt, uh, and also have significant infrastructure investments in countries. So, you know, we do know Africa well, and it's a very important part of our underlying business. Um, with respect to sort of the impact of COVID, you know, I, I won't talk about the, uh, you know, the humanitarian social impact, because that's, you know, I think that's a very sad and sorry state of affairs as it is around the world, but looking at the economic uh, impacts of, of Africa. Um, what we are seeing at the moment is roughly you know, a one and a half percent GDP year on year decline in GDP. And for some smaller countries, uh, that's for all of Africa, I should say, for some smaller countries, it's uh, close to 8%. Um, we're seeing something in the order of a 5% loss in, in, in public revenues. And we're seeing total exports down to seven, down by 17%. Uh, in some countries, this is even more uh, as a result of, uh, you know, if you like, re reduced economic activity. Um, um, Africa is, is extremely important uh, in the commodity space, and also it's, it's quite dependent on commodities. Um, the vast majority of African countries, in fact, nine out of 10, are rated uh, between 80 and 100% uh, commodity dependent. That means that uh, where commodity depends, dependence uh, reflects roughly 60% of exports. So this is the highest level in the world, uh, higher even than the Middle East, and uh, overall, Africa accounts for over 40% of the commodity dependent countries in the world. So it's really very important. Um, but to continue this, uh, the development of commodities in the space, there's a need for investment. Uh, we need to unlock the mineral wealth of the region. Uh, and this is both in the mining sector, in the oil and energy sector, energy transition sector, so power and renewables, but also in logistics, which is an extremely important part of getting the commodities from the, if you like, the source or supply to the international marketplace. Um, and these, uh, getting the, you know, addressing this is very important. It's also pivotable in the energy exchange because some of Africa's minerals and metals, I mean, it's well known for its oil production, but also, you know, it's, copper is extremely important in global electrification. Uh, aluminium is important in, in uh, high voltage transmission and construction of light materials in transportation. Cobalt is important in, in batteries. So it's a very important part uh, of the, uh, of not only existing commodity mix, but also from a future commodity mix requires a lot of international investment. 
Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Well, look, let's just pick up on oil prices because, as you as you said there, I mean, oil is very important to to Africa as a whole. So, I mean, from your standpoint, Trafigura, a huge oil trader, six million barrels a day. I mean, how long do you think it will be before prices start to recover, or, or perhaps a better way to put that is demand start to recover? A question which is very difficult to answer on, on a global basis. Obviously, we have, we have seen a strong recovery in China, for example, which is almost back at pre-COVID levels, with the ex exception of, of air travel. Um, whereas in, in some of the, you know, the US and other markets, you know, we're still seeing demand significantly down uh, against pre-COVID levels. So therefore, we have, on a global basis, we have got an overhang of, uh, overhang of inventory. It's particularly uh, relevant in the, in the jet fuel area because you know, no one's flying planes, so it's problematic. Uh, also in gasoline demand, we're not seeing the same sort of you know, car traffic, although we are seeing in diesel and gas oil, some of the uh, demands picking up. But effectively, we have an overhang of inventory and this is gonna take some time to work through. So our, uh, our view in the markets are we should, the markets will remain soft uh, for the next six months obviously depending on how the whole COVID situation plays out. We are then looking for a, for, for a recovery to take place towards uh, the latter part of calendar 2021. Okay, so it very much is a case that we've got these huge stock piles around the world that need to be worked through before the price can actually make some movement. So otherwise it's going to flatline for six correct. months, perhaps. Correct, correct. And also we obviously we've, we've seen uh, proactivity on, on by OPEC plus to help try and sort of manage that overhanging situation to manage that, that, that surplus. Yeah, I wanted to come on to that because obviously Africa has a number of OPEC members. Um, how, do you see, how do you see their strategy playing out then over the next six months? I mean, if there is this much excess capacity in the market, they're going to have to be restraining production st still? Well, I think you've seen a pretty responsible uh, reaction and decisions by, by OPEC. Uh, they have effectively, you know, there was a, if you like, a, you know, consumption fell off a cliff earlier this, this year, mm. a significant reduction in demand, and they moved very quickly and decisively to curb production and trying to rebalance the market to some degree to reduce the overhang. Um, so I think, you know, past performance would suggest, you know, they are very proactive in trying to, you know, manage the, the inventory surplus and keep the, keep the market in, in relative order. Um, longer term, obviously, we, we're going to have to see, uh, I think it's important to understand, we're going to have to see higher prices to effectively incentivize new production of, of oil and the recovery of oil production. And, you know, that whether that number is $55, $60, that's what we're probably going to require for not longer term capital investment. Well, that's an interesting point. So what you're saying there effectively is we've seen a big slowdown in investment in the oil industry, yet at the same time, fields are declining, production is going down. So at some point, there's going to be a, need, a new splurge of investment, regardless of the energy transition and some of the debates that we're having around fossil fuels and climate change. Mm. Splurge is a strong word, but what I, I do, what we do need to do, we need to see continuing investment to maintain production levels to supply the global marketplace. That is clear. Um, we, are, we are seeing an energy transition, but, you know, it's not going to be a very quick process. Transition means you know, it's going to take a period of time. And oil is still a very important part of mobility around the world. It's also important in the petrochemicals industry. So we're going to see oil is going to be around for quite a long time. Uh, maybe it reduced volumes. Peak oil you know, is likely to occur within the next decade. And, uh, and so therefore, but longer term, you know, we're going to need capital investment. Part of the problem as well is, is that you know, there are, um, people are more attracted uh, from a capital investment point of view into renewable energy and other forms of, of, of energy. And as a result of that, you know, oil is less attractive and maybe we, we're, we're going to have to see higher capital returns required for that sector. Yeah, and what I'm picking up there is you're not as bearish on demand as some of the oil majors. I mean, we've seen a couple talk about perhaps demand might have peaked already, um, but you're saying it's going to happen in the next decade Look, it's it's uh, it's very subjective it's not clear particularly in the current environment um i think we've been we've been quite clear that we think peak oil is round about 2030 but it could have been brought or brought earlier because of the current situation we're seeing remember if you just look at aviation it took um 
you know, after 9-11, four years for aviation uh, travel, for air travel to recover. I think it was something in the region of eight years um, following the, uh, the global financial crisis. So there is a, a period of time which is going to take to recover that air travel. And at the same time, we're looking at different forms of energy. So difficult to determine when it's, when it's going to take place. I think there's other aspects which is interesting in terms of human patterns. Are we seeing people move out of bigger cities? Are we seeing going to see more gasoline consumption? Are people taking their cars more than public transport? These are things we just don't know right now. So therefore, a little bit, the jury's still slightly out with respect to what uh, oil demand is going to be, at least within the next you know, three to five years. Okay. And just to dial back on your earlier point on OPEC, it seems like they're going to have to keep production discipline for at least another six to nine months, given the, the slack in the oil market. Potentially, but also, uh, you know, as I said, there is capital required for the industry. We are seeing cutbacks elsewhere, and we're possibly seeing less capital being attracted to the sector. So there's a balance, and we have to sort of see what is going to be going to be the impact on overall production. Okay. Now, traffic is not just an oil trade. You've got a big metals business as well. Correct. And copper is a key commodity for you. And you referenced in your opening remarks the importance of this metal to the energy transition. Now, can we talk about the prices there? I mean, because copper in contrast to oil has had a really big bounce back. And that's being driven what? Correct. Chinese that, demand? What are you seeing? Uh, look, first of all, we saw consumption across the world drop off a cliff uh, on all commodities, on everything. So therefore, we saw a significant decline in, in metal prices. Copper, uh, if I recall correctly, was trading just just below seven thousand dollars, six thousand seven hundred dollars a ton, you know, early in the year, early in the year, uh, late last year. Um, we saw the demand collapse, and all prices come off quite significantly. The issue is each commodity is behaving differently according to you know, the different dynamics within COVID. So therefore, with respect to supply, copper was drastically hit. You saw a significant reduction in supply, particularly on Latin America. And even in Africa, where we saw logistics challenged as a result of the COVID situation. So therefore, we saw supply constraint as well as demand declines. Then we saw the recovery in China. And that recovery is, was very strong in terms of infrastructure. So we're talking infrastructure development, property development, and, and, and also in electrification, uh, also communications. So therefore, that was very, that's very copper intensive. We saw a very significant increase in copper consumption really so July, August, and September in China. Now, some of that might have been opportunistic from my pricing point of view, but a very strong rebound in real demand. And now we're seeing copper prices actually back up to pre-COVID levels of around about $6,700. And the outlook looks very positive. The amount of copper consumption and electrification associated with what China's announced recently in terms of their carbon policies, the Green Deal in Europe, and elsewhere through electrification, this is very, very positive for copper demand. So the outlook looks quite And positive for Africa, because Correct. big new deposits are difficult to find. Yeah. In Latin America, a lot of the big mines are, have got very, very low grades now. So Africa looks to be the frontier for Look, copper exploration. Would you agree with that? Sure. The copper belt in Africa, so Zambia, DRC, and maybe if, if it expands into Angola as well, is a, is a highly prospective, very, you know, very uh, uh, copper bearing region, um, very high grades. Um, it is in Central Africa. So to get it out, it requires logistics. Um, so therefore, you know, we currently move it through Dar es Salaam, through Angola, through Richards Bay, Port Elizabeth, Walvis Bay. So all using all the various corridors to get the material out. So infrastructure is, is required. Also, you know, capital is required to, to develop these projects. And these are sometimes challenging environments and some, some institutions shy away from developing these while, while they may be extremely rich resources and great for the countries within which uh, they are, they're, you know, they're currently located. Um, but, you know, it requires capital. And so therefore that is a challenge. Well, I think that's an extremely important point because we're seeing a lot of Western companies Western banks shying away from, from difficult countries in Africa, and the void is being filled by the Chinese. By the Chinese, is that a concern? Do you think? Well, it's, it's up to the countries to make that comment. But the Chinese, obviously, are, you know, they're very present. For example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
in both copper and cobalt uh, uh, developments in terms of mine developments, even building smelters as well in those regions. So you know, you're seeing both private sector and state sectors um, really providing the capital required to develop these, these projects. We are seeing it elsewhere in other you know, Western banks. You know, we're obviously significant trader and commercial, have a commercial business there. And we are, we are supported both by African and international banks as well. But for long-term capital investment, we're going to require, you know, at the moment, the Chinese are very, very prevalent. Okay. So just a, a wider point, picking up what you said there about logistics. I mean, how do commodity trading companies help the economic recovery in Africa post-COVID? At the moment... The, our role from a purely logistics point of view is getting the material at the, at the most efficient and lowest cost possible way from so within obviously the proper means and, and compliant, et cetera, um, uh, from source to end marketplace. And that's what we do. So we're, we're looking to do that in the most efficient and effective manner. Um, however, you know, given that within the current platform, there's a lot of investment required. So where's the investment required to assist us? You know, an efficient way is rail. Obviously, we can, uh, you know, both from the exports of, 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 of commodities and, and production, but also for imported products. Um, we're also, you know, from the oil point of view, can we build infrastructure with respect to oil storage and distribution? We have a, one of our subsidiaries, Puma, is very active regionally. Um, so managing terminals, managing oil supply, all these sorts of things, capital is required, particularly as we see population growth and, and, and growth in GDP, you're going to require these types of resources, these types of investments to fuel the economy and to fuel demand. Yeah, and one particular example I wanted to highlight was just what you're doing in LPG, which you see as an alternative, I think, to sort of using wood for cooking and things like that. And, but that's quite an expensive product to get into the country. So that's another way that the trading community can, or trading houses can work with uh, countries in Africa. Correct. I mean, you know, while we're there to move commodities, we're also there to assist in terms of the development of those uh, those countries and those economies in a responsible and meaningful way. And, you know, LPG is one of these ways where it's effectively displacing wood burning. Uh, and we're looking at different ways and more productive ways with which we can supply these uh, to, you know, local communities. Um, it does have its logistical challenges. We're partnering up with different people to try and do this in an efficient and productive way. Okay, can we just move on to another commodity, renewables? Yes. You've just announced uh, a big joint venture with a target of two gigawatts of projects within five years. Now, I know you've been, Afri you've been active in Africa before, a solar project, I think, in Mali. Correct. Um, you just how are you looking at Africa seriously for renewable pro projects? We are. Um, our announcement really looked at sort of um, investments of two gigawatts of, of, of renewable energy uh, covering wind, solar, and storage. Um, and we're looking at both investments in, in uh, if you like, OECD kind of develop, world, developing uh, or developed economies and those emerging markets and where the opportunity set is higher with significant challenges as well. We're looking at it, it maybe acquiring existing platforms, but also developing from scratch. And for us, we think where there's a real potential in Africa is not just like the, the solar farm that we invested in Mali, but also in you know, off-grid, you know, small sort of micro-grid type of investments, which we can look at combination of solar, even LPG, uh, battery type of uh, facilities to help domestic and localized economies start to improve their efficiencies and, and develop as, a, as an economy. And what are some of the challenges around those projects? Like anything, it's particularly on the smaller ones, you need to find the right platform. You need to write, find the right uh, technology, which is appropriate for those regions. Um, but we're partnering up with people which can assist in identifying those types of investments and, uh, and trying to bring the lead time down. Because often in some areas, the lead time for some of these projects and development takes a long time. We want to try and fast track those because obviously from a return point of view, it's more attractive to us, but also for the communities within which we invest, it's better for them as well. And given the risks and the complications involved, can you make a, an adequate return from these projects? The return hurdle differs between the, what, the stage of the, of the project, but also the region. One thing we do is if we're looking at in, in investing in Africa, we like to invest where we have boots on the ground. So we've got a strong appreciation 
of what the demands of the local local population is, what the demands of the local stakeholders are, and in terms of we've got a comfort. It does not just sitting here in Geneva sort of trying to do an analysis on those underlying investments, but also really making sure that we know that we can deliver those. Yes, as I said, the return hurdle varies between the different sorts of projects, but there is a lot of competition for capital for these types of investments. So therefore, it's not, uh, you know, I'd say the, the returns are probably the acceptable range. Developed economies, equity returns for, for, for renewable energy is really in the 5 to 8%. In, uh, in you can say, emerging markets or more challenging environments, maybe towards the 12 to 15%, but that's equity returns. So it's, they're, not, uh, they're not outrageous. Okay. So while you're going to be looking at renewables there, fossil fuels are still going to play a big part in the energy mix in Africa going forward. Um, but uh, but we see, we sort of hear a lot in the West about, you know, we shouldn't be investing in these projects anymore. We shouldn't be going, you know, putting capital to work there. Banks are shying away from them. But I mean, in the African perspective, these these things are still needed. Like thermal coal is still needed. Oil will still be needed. Um I mean, how I do you the, look at it? The way we look at it is that we are going through an energy transition. As I said before, this is a transition. It's not just one big jump. The technology is not there to eff effectively energize the world through a different process and a different format. Um, we will require, I mean, coal will be required for a period of time. Um, now, we've got to find responsible ways to wind in and down that, but it's very important, for example, in South Africa, the bow of the country, which is already having, which has currently has, having brownouts. So therefore, you know, that's an important medium. Oil as well will be here for a long period of time. We cannot electrify all of Africa and everyone driving around in electrical vehicles. It's just not, you know, it's just not going to happen overnight. So these type of things is going to take a while to take place. Um, we just need to manage this responsibly over a period of time. And therefore, I think, you know, oil production is going to be there for a while. I think, you know, coal production will be there for a while, probably not as long, I don't believe, personally. Um, and uh, and we're going to just transition over a period of time. Hydrogen and other things will take some time to come to the fore, but it's not going to happen overnight. Okay. And in Africa, I mean, one way that trading houses do work with countries is the provision of resource-backed loans uh, yeah. to raise, you know, finance for development. Um, can we just talk a bit more about how we can make those processes a bit more transparent. So, you know, citizens of countries understand what is happening. Um, where do you stand on, on this debate? I mean, I know there's some new rules coming in from EITO at the moment, which is an organization that you've been involved in quite heavily. I mean, I mean, how important is it to get more transparency into that process? I think as you're aware, Neil, as a company, we're, you know, we're very transparent in what you do, obviously, for, you know, there's some sort of, if you like, commercial uh, business has to be done in a certain way, but but that's uh, in terms of how how these loans uh, they're often they're backed by uh, international banks. Uh, it's it's a well trodden path in terms of a, a type of financing. Um, in terms of transparency, in terms of what the you know use of proceeds, how they're structured, we have no issue, and we've actually you know authorised some white papers, produced some publications around these type of activities, so people become more aware in terms of what we're trying to do, what the role and the function is and who are the evolved partners. This is not something which is secretive and behind closed doors. It's something very much which is, a, as I said, a well-trodden path and something which I think is a very good instrument with, you know, which, uh, which governments can use to finance themselves. Yeah, but sadly, it seems the government don't reveal that much about them and we tend to only hear about them when they go wrong. And there must be countless examples of when that doesn't happen. So, I mean, it does seem that the that debate needs to evolve, evolve a bit more to get a bit more transparency. And so we don't have a situation sure. where people only find out about things a couple of years later. Yeah, look, I, I, as you said, I think you highlight the thing, when they go wrong, and often if commodity prices are depressed for a period of time, or there's some issues on production, et cetera, sometimes there can be problems associated with these things. Typically, when you're when you're structuring these type of facilities, you go to a lot of due diligence and, and look at the robustness of the, of the commercial flows able to support those. But coming back to your point, there's no issue around transparency. These things are, you know, as I said, well-trodden path, very happy to have them in the open market, very happy for people to understand in more detail what the role is, because at the end of the day, these type of facilities should be there to help producing nations develop their resources and improve their, you know, their economies. That should be the function. Yes, indeed, indeed. Okay, well, um, 
if we just um, go back to to the oil market then and, and just continue that, I mean, how have you got a lot of appetite to do more of these resource back loans at the moment? We we have needs. I think what is interesting is that given the current marketplace, um, we are seeing you know different forms of capital required. Should I say to these businesses? You know, if you look at the market capitalization for some of the large oil companies, drop significantly. Look at some of the issues uh, in the U.S. So therefore, you know, people and, and producers are looking at different ways in which they can finance themselves to continue an operation. And this is one of the various types of facilities involving fresh capital which can be utilised. So we do, you know, we've been using, uh, you know, if you like, uh, prepayments uh, for the private sector, for the government sector for many years across our entire commodity complex with, with, with which we deal. And... Uh, and we, uh, and we think this is a very good instrument and therefore we will continue to see these things develop along with other forms of capital uh, availability or structures which can be provided to the industry. Well, Jeremy, I'm afraid we must leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us and running through um, the major commodities, oil, metals and renewable. It's been a fascinating insight into what we can expect from commodity markets going forward. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Neil. A pleasure. Thank you very much.